I'm Indy Nidell. I'm Pai from Sabaton, and this is Sabaton History. A German soldier defying Hitler's orders might sound dangerous to you, and it was, but for one man it was necessary to save many lives. And we were looking for a story where the Germans was not always the bad guys. A story which I'm going to tell you right now, and then Per is going to tell you about the song. From the beginning of the Soviet Union's final World War II offensive towards Berlin on April 16, 1945, the situation on the Eastern Front had deteriorated rapidly for the Germans. By the 22nd, Soviet tank corps spearheads were already starting to surround Berlin from the north and the south. With the encirclement of Berlin soon at hand, German high command from the bunkers under the city center were calling for immediate assistance. The 12th Army, under General of the Panzertruppe Walter Wenck, had just retreated east of the Elbe at this point, fighting a losing battle against the American advance from the west. Now beyond the river, they could make a stand while providing a tactical reserve against that advance. But the Fuhrer's orders changed their enemies. Now Wenck's 12th was ordered to strike to the east, into the Soviet flanks, and to relieve Berlin. However, what was called an army a corps, or even a detachment this late in the war, was often nothing more than a mixed group of veterans, stragglers, wounded, and conscripted youngsters and middle-aged and even old men. Wenck's 12th had a large group of basically kids from the Hitler Youth, young men who hadn't finished school, and they were now tasked with taking on Russian tanks. According to General Feldmarshal Wilhelm Keitel, they were to unite with additional Panzer Corps, tank corps, under General Felix Steiner to the north, while the trapped 9th Army would make a break to the west and join them. Together, they were to relieve the capital from the Soviets, who had over a million men advancing. It was a plan, at least, but one that only existed on paper. Wenck's army had only recently been reorganized with men from all branches that could still fight. That was the only requirement. But even this late in the war, the German army was still able and reliable, and they still had fight in them even in a futile battle. The army's diaries of this day read, no deserters, no prisoners, no missing. Who could ever have believed? Seems like nothing's been achieved. Just to walk a day, go all the way. The thrones are closing in as the end is drawing near. The twelfth army interfere. The 12th Army was heading to Berlin. They had only a few vehicles and tanks, mostly mobile assault guns and little fuel, so the men had to make the 150 kilometers to Berlin on foot. By the 25th, they had reached the outskirts of Berlin, but the situation had worsened dramatically. The Soviets were already south of Potsdam and east of Brandenburg and der Havel, west of Berlin. The surrounding of the capital was nearly complete, and the Soviet forces were much stronger than anticipated. While examining his maps, General Wenck hesitated. Was relieving Berlin even possible at this point? In talks with Keitel, though, the orders from the bunkers under Berlin were clear. Get the Fuhrer out. His destiny is Germany's destiny. Only you, Wenck. Only you have the power to save Germany now. So Wenck went to work. The only chance to relieve Berlin at this stage was to split his troops towards the north and south and relieve as many of the defending German forces around Berlin as possible so they could make up a small reserve for an attack towards Berlin itself. This would maybe destroy enough Soviet forces or just hold them back enough to give Berlin some breathing space and for civilian refugees to escape the city. But even that would only be temporary. But Keitel rejected this plan. Berlin itself had highest priority. A push toward the Fuhrer must be done immediately, and that's it. Well, Wenck knew that this would quickly be the suicide of his army, and he realized that German high command had totally lost touch with the situation 
and the reality of the war. Steiner's tanks in the north were already being pushed back and the 9th was fighting for its life. In this situation, Wink chose not to follow the direct orders from Adolf Hitler himself. Instead, he, quote, had to follow the guideline of his conscience. Saving Berlin was impossible. The only thing his army could maybe achieve was getting as many people away from the Soviet advance as possible. By attacking towards Potsdam, he would relieve the encircled garrison there. And by creating a corridor from there towards Berlin, they'd be able to let refugees flee the city. An attack to the south would give the Ninth Army a chance to join their lines. Wenck called this his Rettungswerk, pretty much his rescue mission. Only on this would he gamble the lives of his young soldiers. In the early morning hours of April 26, the final German offensive of the war began. Who'll survive and who will die? Up to Kriegsglück to decide. Those who made it cross without a loss have reason to reflect. It is not about Berlin. It is not about the Reich. It's about the men who fought for them. What peace can they expect? Elements of the 12th Army made their way northeast. The key to their advance was the infantry division Hutten, hardcore veterans who had just days before recaptured Wittenberg from the Soviets and held off overwhelming forces for days. Now they were the wedge that drove into the Soviet positions with artillery and tank hunters. The Soviets were totally caught off guard by the attack, and by midday, the 12th Army had advanced 18 kilometers toward the city of Bielitz. On Hutten's flank were the elite Scharnhorst Grenadiers, who pushed down the Autobahn through the night, throwing themselves against the tenacious Soviet defense. House to house fighting against superior heavy tanks was vicious and costly, and they often had to resort to close-range attacks with Panzerfausts, single-shot anti-tank guns. They went days without sleep or sufficient food, while the Soviets were constantly reinforced, but despite heavy casualties, they made progress towards Berlin. By May 1st, the 9th Army had managed to use the momentum of the 12th and break out of their encirclement. Spirits rose as the exhausted soldiers of the 9th and the hundreds of civilians with them joined the 12th. But seeing the ragged and wounded men limping into his ranks, Wenck marveled at Hitler's insane plan to fight the Soviets head on. The 9th had been nearly destroyed just fighting for its survival and the survival of the many civilians in its midst. Other fighting forces were able to link up with Wenck as well. And the same day, Hutten reached a large German military hospital near Potsdam. Once more, the fighting was brutal as they stormed the Soviet trenches, but for 24 hours, they were able to get many hundreds of wounded soldiers, nurses, and Red Cross personnel out before the Soviets could return. This was the very end of the European part of the war, and it is difficult to find and follow the reports from the last days of the fighting around Berlin. The Germans did not make many records. The Americans also often didn't record a lot of it, and the Soviet archives are still not fully available. Neither Steiner nor Wenck reached Berlin, though, and Hitler chose suicide over capture in his bunker. On May the 2nd, Wenck's army retreated. It would protect the refugees and bring them across the Elbe and into American custody. Day and night they marched, avoiding contact with the enemy from the east as long as possible. Soviet pursuit, though, was initially weak as they were concentrating on taking Berlin. On the 3rd, Wenck made contact with American General William Simpson of the 102nd U.S. Infantry Division of the 9th U.S. Army near Tangermunde. Now, the Allies had agreed among themselves that either the German army would capitulate as a whole or that small groups could capitulate to them individually via their commanding officers. But there was a hitch. This partial capitulation could only happen to the opponent they're actually engaged with, which for Wenck was the Soviets. To surrender to the Americans, Wenck technically would have to attack them and then surrender. Well. The Americans simply kept silent in regard to the surrender proposal. They did not fire on the advancing Germans either, in violation of the Allied contract. Still, General Simpson let the wounded cross the river, but only with just enough medical supplies for them. 
Same with Venk's soldiers and their personal provisions. But he would not allow civilians to cross. Men were even sent out with whips on the partially collapsed bridge to hold back civilians trying to cross with the soldiers. It could have been more of a human tragedy were it not for sudden Soviet fire that rocked the remnants of the bridge. This killed several American soldiers, so a two-kilometer retreat from the river was ordered. This allowed civilians to cross the river. Venk's army soon had to fight the Soviets, though, who had renewed their attacks once they realized what was going on. With each break in the lines, Venk had to order young men to their deaths to recapture and hold positions for just an hour or two so that others could live. It was a final act of self-sacrifice in a war that was essentially over. As the last German grenades were shot, the last artillery pieces and the last tanks were blown up, and then the last German soldiers, among them General Walter Wenck himself, crossed the river and entered American captivity. In the end, thousands of soldiers, civilians, nurses, women, children, and the elderly were saved from the fall of Berlin. As an end note here, on the 8th of May, as the very end came, many men and women attached to the 9th Army were extradited back to the Soviets. To this day, we don't know the exact reasons for that, though we do know that there were several suicides to escape that fate. See the city burn on the other side Going down in flames as to words collide Who can now look back with a sense of pride On the other shore there's the end now, you said that this song was inspired by a video game. Can you uh, dig right, into that yeah. a little? There, yeah. There's a game called Hearts of Iron. Right. So, and we have a song called Hearts of Iron. So, there's obviously a connection there. Right. So, uh, many years ago, when we had a concert in Stockholm, we were approached uh, at an after party by people from this uh, Swedish development studio of games called Paradox. Right. And uh, some of the guys came and they said that they were big fans of us and they really appreciate the work that we are doing with uh, writing uh, music about history. And we, we started to talk about that we are doing pretty much the same thing. I mean, they are doing games about history and we are doing music about it. They asked us, is there any way that you, you can like write a song that would be like a lead theme for, for our game that is coming? And we said, okay, and when we were researching, we came across the story about Walter Wenck, and uh, it took a while to uh, to keep discussing and developing the idea. We we did uh, other things connected to this, and inside of Hearts of Iron, yeah. there is released now soundtrack of Sabaton. Okay. So uh, it was possible to get the music, our songs, when you play the game. It's pretty funny actually today, but a lot of our fans in China. Right. discovered Sabaton through Hearts the game Hearts of Iron. Okay. When we speak sometimes with developers of games, they often talk about how important music is inside of that. Game, sure. And it's pretty funny because uh, for a lot of people today, music is not important anymore. I mean, you see the whole uh, industry of music taking a big tough hit and uh, mm. people are not as willing to pay for music as they used to be. Well, there you have it, Hearts of Iron 4 featuring Sabaton music, and that was all for today with Hearts of Iron. On Sabaton History Channel. Alright, thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe to the Sabaton History Channel, check out the Indies other channels, and support us on Patreon, because that's what makes this happen. Mm.